All right, we're in. Now I can actually eat something. Here. All right. <laughs> Bring in the cadaver. <laughs> Heritage Craft Butchers in Mariana, Pennsylvania. I'm with my buddies Bob and Jared. They're gonna show us how to butcher a pig today. But we can't do that on an empty stomach, so basically right now we're gonna try some of this amazing sliced meat while they tell us a little bit about their stories. So guys, how did this all happen? My wife and I uh, moved down to a small farm, a homestead, if you will, in Greene County, Pennsylvania, about six years ago. And uh, we started raising, you know, pigs, ducks, chickens, just sort of self-taught, like how to break them down and turn them into value-added products like what you have on the board here. We did that for a year or so, and then uh, reconnected with a uh, guy, Wes, who was my roommate for one semester in college, um, he just found me on Facebook one day and sent me a message and said, hey, you know, I've always wanted to slaughter a pig and turn, turn it into all the stuff, you know? And I was like, well, today is your lucky day. <laughs> and then along the way, uh, through a mutual friend of uh, Wes and myself, met Jared, and Jared's a, what, forager? Yeah, so our friend uh, Jamie, you know, said, hey, I mean, I'd like to come down to your house, uh, you know, maybe have something to eat, just talk about the farm and everything, and do you mind if I bring my friend who's a forager? And I was, of course, like, sure, knock yourself out for whoever you want. Bring that weirdo. Yeah, and I, I, had a, I had an image in my head of what just Jamie's friend, the forager, was, <laughs> and it was, it was pretty right. It was right? not that far yeah. off. It was really close, yeah. <laughs> oh, that, we had, um... What, do we have the, the bison testicles? Yeah, bison testicles. Cured duck eggs and some other stuff. And Deconstructed bison. Just sort of, um, so which one of these was the bison testicles? None of those. <laughs> none of those. That was a one and done. Uh, it was project. good though. It wasn't yeah. bad. It was yeah. good. That year I got, you know, another pig for Wes. Got a pig for Jared. Unfortunately, at, you know, nine, ten months go by and Jared's pig didn't actually grow at all. So Jared's pig started off this big and ended up you know, this big. <laughs> You gave him a pot belly, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, you know, we got to the end of that year, and um, we, you know, we were making Italian style uh, charcuterie, Spanish style charcuterie, in an old barn, in a barn. Oh, cool. Um, you know, we had built you know curing chambers out of old refrigerators. We butchered all those animals. We made salamis and copas and and, and prosciuttos, and got them all hung up there, and had sort of that realization at the end of it of like we have thousands of pounds of cured meats that you we we're going to eat like an ounce at a time and there's no way we're ever going to finish it and we'd like to do this again next year like keep it going but we can't do it at this volume so we were like hey why don't we open a butcher shop Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot of bur bourbon involved. A little bit. All right, so you have this huge stash of stuff you guys have been, you know, experimenting with, trying yeah. out, and you decided the only way we're going to be able to do this again is if we sell some of this because there's too much. Correct. Yeah. Where do you go from there? <laughs> well, look at a building. Logically, you should tell your wife <laughs> that you've made this decision. <laughs> I thought that I did. Oh, yeah, we started looking for buildings until uh, this old bank popped up in the uh, weekly email from the from the real estate agent. It was affordable. I mean, it was a cheap building, had a vault. It seemed like it was in, in reasonable condition. And uh, then you just sort of, it, it, you take it piecemeal. You know, being the general contractor for a, a renovation of turning a bank into a butcher shop is not, it's not a turnkey operation. So, yeah, I like... Anywhere we would be, we would have a, an 
extreme overhead to turn any building into what we wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, so we found this building that was very cheap, and we kind of walked in and saw how it was going to be laid out. We were yeah, like absolutely. immediately. It was the first building. We were like, and we knocked down that wall, and that'll be the cutting room, and it just kind of yeah. it was a no brainer. When we walked, when I walked in, I was like taken aback by how beautiful it looks. But what really surprised me was, as we're touring the facility, looking where we're going to film today, uh, this cutting room is surrounded by thick glass. I thought that was a health code thing. I'm thinking, oh, they got to have people watching the cutting. they got to be behind glass. Buying a bank worked out perfect. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the bullet-resistant uh, 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 acrylic panes of glass that were already there. And it, it was just a pragmatic thing. It was like... I. I still don't know how we would actually remove those if we wanted to. <laughs> so it just worked at, by leaving them there, it created a barrier from, you know, the retail area and the production area. See how the sausage gets made. Yeah. I mean, that's, a lot of it was just uh, transparency uh, to, we want people to come in and watch us do things. It, there's nothing that's hidden yeah. and, and, and uh, away from public view because... You know, the process was interesting to us. I mean, that's what we got started doing was just like the mechanics of it and the process and the ingredients. So uh, being able to share that with people, like regular customers. I mean, even like with the butchery clinics and the different events that we have, a lot of it is just based on um, giving away all the secrets, you know. I mean, yeah. it, that's, I think that's a that's a uh, something from... from days of yore of the whole like oh there's a secret ingredient if I told you to have to kill you type of thing. it's like no I mean I'll, I'll, I'll teach anybody how to make sausage or bacon or prosciutto or whatever these are salamis that are fermenting they're not all that pretty yet we inoculate this machine is a proofing cabinet this is where you would make uh, you would raise bread you put dough in there and it would it would ferment and it would fluff up and everything like that what we do is when we make salami is we inoculate the mix with a culture of lactobacillus bacteria. And then there's some sugar in the, in the cure. There's some red wine, there's some dextrose or whatever. That bacteria will eat that sugar and produce lactic acid. So whenever you eat salami and it kind of tastes like, um, like garlicky but tangy, like a little bit of a sour flavor, yeah. that's lactic acid. So what we're doing in there is cultivating the bacteria that make... Is the lactic acid bad? No, it's good. No. Botulism, C. botulinum bacteria, what gives you food poisoning? Real bad. Doesn't grow in acidic environments, it doesn't grow in oxygenated environments, and it doesn't... Isn't that like everywhere on the earth? In the oxygen? Right, except whenever you, if you do canning, like you can green beans, mm -hmm. You're removing all the oxygen from the can, so you have an anaerobic environment. And green beans aren't naturally acidic, so you have to either add acid to it or do or pressure can them to kill the spores. By fermenting these, they become acidic. It drops the pH, and by doing that, it prevents botulism from growing in that sausage. So it's basically one of the steps to preventing food poisoning. That's why once they're done here and we hang them in that room, they can hang in there at 55 degrees for six months without turning like into poison basically, <laughs> more or less. culture of what we're trying to do here with all the local foods, um, trying to bring in all these local animals, these heritage animals, and show people the process. The people, our customers are different than people that are just going to go to Walmart and get their meat. Um, so they, they kind of want that more interactive. They want to see exactly how everything's being made and, and how we're cutting it up. Let's talk about this board yeah, because sure. I mean this is we were gonna get right to cutting pigs and then I saw this I was like I'll hold the phone we have another <laughs> video to make what are some of these cuts here that we're looking Jared at that you're not gonna find anywhere else um, so I mean we can start with our mortadella which is bologna for lack of a better word um, but this is an older recipe um, there's a little liver in it we've got uh, pistachios there's big chunks of pork fat um, some green peppercorn it's just fresher and, and different than Oscar Mayer. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and we've got a can't yeah, help yourself, but go yeah, for it. Go and for there it. was one. Uh, we are missing what, what one. Was there? What was there? What was Genoa? That was the Genoa. Yeah, uh, large Genoa. diameter. Your your canonical Genoa salami. That was the ten year old approved. That one is <laughs> gone. That was definitely <laughs> good. Yeah, for sure. And then we have a, a Cantapalos chorizo. We've got a Pamplona chorizo, and the chorizos are fun because you know there's the regional Spanish chorizos. Um, with, with varying, they're, they're all very similar. There's a lot of paprika, some spice in them. For example, that Pamplona style chorizo, like most of your, your canonical um, Spanish chorizos are going to be all pork with lots of like smoked uh, pimenton or you know, smoked Spanish paprika. But um, in Pamplona, that's where you have like the running of the bulls. So like, you know, once a year you have a bunch of well-exercised beef that isn't necessarily ideal for cutting T-bones or ribeyes or something like that. So the, the primary uh, meat in that chorizo is beef, and it's studded with pork fat. It has you know, the, the pimenton dolce or picante from, you know, from Spain in there. But, I mean, the cow itself is from three miles that way or one mile that way or seven miles that way. So you have uh, a hyper-local um, base product and then imported ingredients, you know, whether herbs and spices and stuff like that. So that that recipe there was their solution to the running of the bulls. We have all this extra yeah. meat right. that's not going to be good steaks. Right. They made that. Exactly. That is so cool, that story that behind cool. that. Yeah. What else we got there, Jared? You got some pepperoni uh, yeah, down pepperone, there. Pepperoni, um, just an older recipe, pepperoni. Um, the guy in the middle there is one of our original recipes. It's just garlic, rosemary. Um, one of our employees just decided to make that. Um, she actually pan like roasted the rosemary to really embolden that flavor, and it really comes out. Um, it's good stuff. Can I ask you a, a question? Absolutely, please where, do. Where do you get all your meat? Where do you get the cows? Do people send you in cows, and then you do the butcher and then send it back to them? So, or do you get your own? No, we. We source from local farmers that, that have become friends. We have this whole heritage family of, of several beef farmers, uh, pork farmers. Um, so what we'll do is we, we talk to the farmer and we say, hey, we want two beef this month. They send them in to a local slaughterhouse. We don't slaughter here. Um, so all of our animals are slaughtered under USDA um, regulation. And then we get them, we get quartered cows and uh, have pigs and whole goats and lamb. That's not good. good. Wow, that was great. And we, we yeah, we, we cut them here from mm -hmm. from the whole quartered cows or, or whatever. You'll see a half pig pretty here, pretty soon here. The top half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a left half. Yeah, it's a left. Well, he's a lefty, <laughs> so he's happy. Right cool. Here. We got a southpaw <laughs> pig. Yeah, then uh, what do we got here? A mole salami yeah. um, based on like your, your Mexican stewing spices, your mole sauce with uh, cumin and ancho chili powder and guajillo chilies, cocoa, cocoa nibs. nibs, cocoa powder, nice. like, all that kind of good stuff. It, it tastes like a Mexican restaurant. It's fantastic. That's this guy here? Yeah. So we, I uh, spent a lot of time in Mexico with my buddies growing up surfing. Yeah. And uh, mole, man, that was, my uncle is Mexican. And he that so I went with him and it was like all right what is he ordering I'm gonna order that yeah and every yeah, time it'll snow like that. so cool okay rewind <laughs> that is awesome <laughs> that is a Mexican party in the we'll give all oh, the credit great. to Wes our third who is not able to be here he, he has developed that. Each, each iteration of, of these different recipes are either a little bit better or a little bit different. That is a Mexican That's party in the mouth. That's awesome. Yeah. That's <laughs> third seat. Yeah. Spill some for our, our homie Wes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, That's that great. is good, guys. That, yeah, it, that one is great. But it's all been fantastic. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, we got a cut here from an Osaba Island pig. Uh -huh. You guys are big, obviously, into heritage breeds. Tell me a little. I know we'll learn more as we're cutting up the pigs, but Absolutely. why do you guys like working with heritage breeds? You know, your, your heritage breeds, they were developed uh, and throughout history for particular purposes by particular people. Um, and they have their own characteristics. And generally, um, they were bred to take advantage of either um, habit or terroir or climate or to produce... Um, uh, specific products, whether it's pork fat or beef musculature or a long, you know, uh, broad pork belly. 
um, and pretty much like uh, uh, speed of growing to market weight or you know water retention weren't qualities that were bred into those animals so they are basically they were bred for quality and um, resilience and durability and stuff first and uh, as opposed to your 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 modern hybrid uh, commodity animals which are just how quickly can you grow to 180 pounds you know if it's three months great if it's five months okay whatever and everything else kind of takes a back seat to that um, so by using you know first local second heritage breeds we knowing what the, the the hallmark of the breed is we can make products that sort of express the uh the value proposition of that thing whether it's a a pig with a really thick buttery fat cap or um you know a, a, a cow or a, you know a steer or whatever that doesn't really get to a market weight until later on in its life uh, that has like a beefy uh you know deep rich flavor to it um we can we're agile enough with the products that we make that we can highlight um, sort of the benefits of each individual animal <laughs> that is a really good skill to have for a homesteader or to know somebody with that yeah, skill yeah. because things get away from you plans change let's say you have a dairy cow who's a couple of years old mm -hmm. and then she's not being rebred and you try you do everything you can now you got this older cow, or maybe it's a breeder pig, a big old sow, that's yep. only going to be good for sausage. Yep. You got, on the homestead, you have a lot of different animals that you're going to have to come up with a creative way to process and handle them. Right. And this is like, I mean, this is ideal now. So just learning a little bit more about the meat, even if you're never, like me, I'm never going to do what you guys do. But I find just dabbling, learning, yeah. a little, as much as you can will better what you do on the homestead, and then you'll find connections with people. Yeah. I think a lot of that is lost because a lot of us grew up getting Walmart steak, mm -hmm. and it's only so many things you know to do with a Walmart steak. Yeah, mom, or the pork story. chops. Yeah. Oh, pork chops. See, we, we Least favorite round, cut. We go round and round with people that are used to supermarket pork chops. Yeah. They have this like thin, sickly, fat cat. Ugh. And they'll come in here or they'll comment on some of our Facebook posts like, oh, there's too much fat on that. I'd never sell a, yeah. sell a pork chop with that much fat on it. Like, you just, you just don't get it. You like don't that. know. That fat is, is it, it might take up like a, a really third of the, <laughs> of the actual meat on it, but it'll render and you'll just get these awesome little cracklings or you can just yeah. cut it off and eat it. And the the health of that fat, these are these are healthier animals. Yeah. These are animals that are eating good food. These are animals that are well cared for and pastured yep. um, and in small quantities and not kept in a pen that, that are they're chewing on the tail in front of them. And these are that fat is actually much better for you yeah. than, than just commodity pork. It's actually proven that it's healthier for you. The key to all this, right, for the homesteader like me, all the way up to what you guys do is the knowledge. And you guys are big on sharing. Like you said, there's no secrets here, right? Absolutely. What do you guys do to the, for the local community and anybody willing to travel to help teach us stuff? Well, we, we have services. I mean, yeah, yeah <laughs> you'll, you'll be seeing shortly um, our, our butchery clinics. We, we actually feed a full course dinner at, at this awesome butcher block, um, family style. Usually a big pork roast and a couple sides. You're going to be full. A uh, little bit of charcuterie involved in that. And then we take you back into the cutting room and we will take apart uh, half of a pig. Sometimes we're, we'll do a, a lamb occasionally. We did a, a venison one that was really popular. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing a beef one next week that's sold out. Yeah, like a hind quarter of beef. Yeah, so just show them how, how we break them down. Yeah. And we don't, we don't use, the bandsaw hardly gets used, never gets used on pork. Um, basically, we only use the bandsaw when we're cutting like T-bones and um, you know the bigger chunks of, of beef. Um, so it's it's all more heritage style yeah. cutting techniques as well. So it kind of comes into the name. Something yeah, anybody could do. Yeah, yeah so I just, we just love stuff like that. But we also do what, yeah, baking we, clinics. Yeah, we just started with a baking clinic. Sim oh, similar nice. thing, a little bit more, not as big of a time commitment where it's like Saturday afternoon, people come in. Everybody has a five pound slab of pork belly and we go through, it's not just like, oh, you know, here's, here's, here's a mix that you put in there. It's like, this is, this is how curing works. This is the, 
the biology, the chemistry, the physics of it. This is why we're applying these ingredients in the quantities that we are. This is what's going to happen to transform this from raw pork into a finished product. Um, and then they have their, uh, they can select whatever spices and herbs that they want to flavor oh, that with. Nice. Custom based. Yeah. That's and then, awesome. you know, an hour later, they're, they're done. They leave two weeks. It cures in the, in the walk-in. Um, and then we smoke that. Uh, repackage it for them, let them know, and they come and pick it up. And it's, uh, I mean, that's been a, sort of like a runaway success oh, over man. the past five yeah, months. We love our bacon. We yeah. dry cure all of our bacon. So it all goes in a vac seal bag with the perfect amount of, of cure and ingredients, uh, individual bags, and then into the smoker. So it's not like we're brining them. Right? Yeah. It takes so a long time. It's labor intensive. <laughs> but it <laughs> makes you know, a superior product. Yeah. The product is fantastic. I mean, we just keep ramping it up. I, I love that idea because people will leave with everything you guys are doing here, people are going to leave with a story. Which yeah. means they're going to tell their friends, mm -hmm. and when their friends hear about it, you're going to get more people here. Exactly. And well, that's how we. This is just snowballed. Yeah. Like word of mouth at first, and now it's all you know. It's all social media. Awesome. So easy to advertise there, and you know we've, we've got some super fans that are just oh yeah, just rallying behind us and telling all their friends. So, so speaking of which, if people want to follow you, if they're not local to Pennsylvania but they want to learn through your social media. Yeah. What do you guys? When does Block Talk launch? Let's talk about that. Don't put, don't put that on me. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're all over Facebook, Heritage Craft Butchers, um, and on Instagram at, at Heritage, Craft, Heritage Craft Butchers. Um, and it's yeah, we we don't do a whole lot of like of the informational videos. We might put some of this up we'll now. We'll have a few today. Uh, but it's if you want to see beautiful pictures of our cuts and and just kind of the unique yeah. things that we're doing here, we we post we. We try to get on a schedule. We literally have a meeting every Tuesday and, and block off who's going to post what every single day. So nice. we usually have a post going out every day, um, just something fun that we're doing. You yeah. definitely should follow their Instagram. Uh, look for the pig snake and say hello from home. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> pig snake. Yeah, the big whole yeah. pig porchetta. We do, yeah, pig roast. I we'll think debone it all from ankle to, to wrist. Yeah. And Kay and I were looking at that today. We were like, we got to we got to find a reason to have a party this summer to do a pig snake. So yeah. <laughs> we'll be calling you guys. <laughs> we'll provide it. We try to, um, like one of the things that early on, I mean, when you're just starting and you barely have any customers, it, it was a lot easier. But we got into sort of a, um, a, a pattern of, you know, if, if people are going to engage with us online or, you know, in email or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, um, like we're gonna answer their question. Like we people ask a stupid question, not a stupid question, but a simple question, and then they get fifteen hundred words back because it's like this is like literally uh, what you need to know. Yeah. And they're like, Oh my god, I can't believe like thank you. you so know? Nice. And, and to the butcher. We still <laughs> we still try to maintain that and it it, it has grown into a significant uh, amount of labor just to, oh, to yeah. communicate with people. But as much as possible that we can do that, there's no reason not to. I mean if you ask a question, if we know the answer to it we're going to tell you what it is. Yeah. And from now on, you're going to record those answers. And that's your first episode of Block Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be pushing that, Bob. Any, yeah, executive any, producer. Any yeah. excuse to buy a, like new computers? <laughs> and, 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 you <laughs> you know, see all it? Like the new Mac Pros out? Pack and light. Yeah. <laughs> we do. We're very responsive to like our social media messages. Yeah. And we get them all day long about you know, simple things like, hey, do you guys have kibasa today? Yes or no. You yeah. know, like, or... You know, can I schedule this, or, or what, awesome. can you explain yeah. to me what this is that you guys do? If um, you guys want to learn more, we'll have links below to your social media stuff. We'll have links below to your website. Uh, you guys do private events, right? Yeah, like indeed. parties. You do the like charcuterie this. events, like this. Yep. <laughs> um, we do a butcher's all kinds table. Of stuff. Oh yeah, the which tables. Uh, that's been very popular. We this whole table will be covered from edge to edge with pickles, cheeses, Ooh, nice. all of our charcuterie, uh, a little bit of candies. You want to come back for pickle candies. day, don't you? Tiered this, things with cheeses indeed. on them, like it's ridiculous. tables from the Maybe Civil we want War. Them off the gluten and dairy free. Diet. There you go. Gluten and dairy free. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, no milkshakes or crackers for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, guys, I could sit here and talk shop all day. Ooh. We got a half a pig to cut up. Indeed. Yeah. So Let's this video is over, but stay tuned because in the next series, we're going to have a whole playlist here with the Heritage Craft Butchers. We're going to show you the steps, taking a half of a pig and breaking it down into all the most delicious things that you love about half of a pig or all of a pig. 
So stay tuned for that. Uh, make sure to subscribe. Thank if you. you follow the playlist, which will show up right here, follow that playlist, you'll see all the videos here. If you like this video, there's an extended version of it in our Pioneer Library. Click here to become a home study pioneer and gain access to the bonus version of this video where we talked about the value of older chickens as meat. You don't have a lot of people, I'm sure, that have chicken. I mean, that's a, 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 an easy foray into right. homesteading. It's just right. like having a flock of chickens. And chickens are so diverse. I mean, there's hundreds of breeds. They're all visually distinct. See that in all our extended versions? Click here to become a pioneer.